So we're here with 16 Bars. I'm Steph, and I'm sitting here with Mariba in Berlin, her first time in Berlin. You haven't seen much, but you will be coming back hopefully soon, right? Absolutely. Okay. I'll be back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is there any tour planned this year? Maybe a Europe tour? I can't say yet. I hope so. I hope I'll be back this year. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a busy year, so we'll see. Yeah. I guess, I mean, you have a lot of press runs, obviously, with your new project out and shit. Yes. Um, but, okay, before we get into anything, now you have to understand something. <coughs> so, two years ago, two years, two and a half years ago, um, I met Black. Mm -hmm. Last year, I met Jid. Mm -hmm. This year, I met Earth Gang. Mm -hmm. And all of them, every time I said, who should I listen to from Atlanta? They said, Mary and Mariba. <laughs> All of them. But now I'm a bit, like, confused because now you just go by Mariba. Yeah. Like, why did you do the name change? Um, always wanted to just go by my last name, but I just, I didn't put too much thought behind it when I first started releasing music. I just went by my full government name. But I just wanted to keep my first name for, like, more family, more personal. And I feel like my last name just sounded like a statement. Like, it just sounded like a one-name sound. Mm -hmm. And also, so in, in Ethiopia, the way that the naming process works is you take your father's first name and it becomes your last name. So um, my father's father's name, his first name is Mariba. And my father took his name as his last name, Tom Rap Mariba. When he came to America, he realized like, okay, that's not how people do things here. <laughs> okay. You know, that'll be really like confusing for people if I do that. So he just kept his last name. And so my last name is my grandfather's first name. And I never got to meet him, but he was um, a traveling man who, he had a very interesting background and I just related to him even though I never met him. I feel like I'm an extension of Mariba. So I just took it as my name. But from like the, being the extension of your granddad, mm -hmm. is it like certain character traits in a way or like just kind of, I mean, obviously your dad must have told you stuff about him and yeah, shit like well, so. actually like, Unfortunately, he passed when my dad was a baby. Okay. So he has this sort of mythical thing in my family. Like, okay. we've heard of him, but like even my dad didn't really know him. So he's just kind of mysterious, and it just is interesting to me. And I know like for a living, what he did was travel from city to city, um, selling things. He was a merchant. And so even me, traveling from city to city doing my music, I relate to his story, you know? And I just fill in some of the gaps with my imagination, because we don't know. A ton about him yeah mystical granddad I like mystical this granddad okay but so when did you then decide to just now cut the Marion from the front it was like two years ago okay. I was about to release something um, I was about to release a song and video called bet and I knew that I had to have my name in the description of things and I'm like this is the time yeah. so I just did it right before releasing that Okay, well, they didn't get the memo because everybody always said Mary and Marie, but to me, because yeah. <laughs> they're my friends too, so they're just kind of like, you know, uh huh, uh huh. But um, I think it's 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 hard for friends to start calling you something different, different yeah. once they've called you that for years, and I've known them all for years, so that's probably why. But but they don't have like a nickname for you, Reeves. Reeves. Oh, that's nice. I like Reeves. That that sounds nice. Yeah. Okay. But then people started call like other people started calling me that, and now they call me Marion again. I feel like they wanted something more <laughs> exclusive, you know. But I like Reeves. Yeah, that sounds, it sounds like a cartoon character's name. Reeves, yeah, it it sounds like a Sherlocky kind of dude. Yeah. He's like always like running around with like a thing, and he's like, oh, it's Reeves again, and yeah. he like looks for shit. I'm I'm sorry, I'm also like <laughs> super crazy, <laughs> like a detective. <laughs> he's like, oh, it's Reeves. Um, no, but okay. So then they changed back because they wanted it to be like a more exclusive yeah, thing. Yeah, I mean, some of my friends still call me Reeves. For sure, okay. yeah. Right. Well, um, okay, so Mariba. Now, I started out with uh, Room for Living. Mm -hmm. This was your first full-length project, mm -hmm. I'm correct. Mm -hmm. Now, I went on, uh, it's a website, it's your website, mm -hmm. and it's still there to download and listen to, if I remember correctly. And uh, I was shocked because mm -hmm. it said in the credits that you had mixed most of your own production and like pretty much everything like it was just like pretty much it, f it felt like you did everything yeah so so okay so can I un ask you what you actually can do like all of it like from guitar to uh guitar uh just production overall um that project I mixed 
along with my friend John Key, who's an amazing producer. He actually just produced all of Solange's album with her. Um, but this was like years ago, and mm. neither of us really knew how to mix at all. <laughs> like, it took so many trial and errors, like mixing something, taking it to the car, listening to it together, and being like, this sounds terrible, and going back. And, you know, we really learned how to use a lot of stuff from that process. Mm -hmm. But um, so that, I play keys, um, obviously songwriter you know I write all my songs um, what else singer singer right poetry spoken word like all of those all of the things that takes writing like I do that part um, and then programming drums like I do all of the production of things like I I just live in my production software and I just do all of the things <laughs> but luckily this project I didn't have to mix got someone who does that for a living to do that because that is like I feel like it's like two completely different worlds like just yeah. producing a beat is one thing and then and mixing and mastering is like a science for itself exactly. and but still the fact that you are capable of doing that like whoa you can pretty much do anything like you don't need anybody to just make your own shit and that's I'm so fire super, I'm just like really um attention or I mean detail oriented that's what it is detail oriented so Yeah, I, I, it's, it's nice when you say it like that, that I can do anything. I just don't like waiting on people and things. And sometimes, you know, especially back then, like I didn't have a, a team or like a support like that. So I just was like, I know I want to release this project. I recorded myself. Like I, rec I literally held the microphone and recorded myself, all of the vocals in that project. because I just didn't want to wait. I just wanted to do it. I wanted to get it out and, um, that's what happened with it. It's a little hard to listen to for me now because I'm like, man, if I had gotten someone to mix it, that would have been dope. <laughs> it would probably would have been a little bit of a better mix, but um, you know, I'm still proud of it. It's, it was definitely the beginning. But you know, you can still always just go back and like have it re yeah. remixed and remastered and whatever. Okay. So I feel like, I feel like that's like not a thing, uh -huh. but okay. But what do you, as a producer, what do you prefer? Like live instruments or you said you're p capable of making drums yourself, etc. Yeah. Like what do you prefer? So what I like to do most is I like the fusion, like everything. I just like, I like the fusion of things that seem to be almost opposite of each other. So I'm a folk guitarist. Like that's how I learned guitar was through folk music and the blues. So finger picking, you know, slides, those sorts of things. That's my style guitar wise. And mixing that with like hard drums, like hard hip hop, like drums, like sample drums, you know? Um, that's almost the basis of what I do is the mix between that like more organic, earthy instrumentation um, and stuff that is like, that you can bop to, you know, stuff that you can move to that has a bounce to it. So once I realized that I was kind of, those were my two favorite things, like things that make you move and instrumentation that makes you feel like really emotional, I just put those two things together to sort of collide, collide you know? And everything else, like, It's a healthy mix. A lot of it is live instrumentation. Like my co-producer, Sam, he plays guitar. Like he's a master guitar player. So he'll come in and like add more intense guitar parts. I'm just like kind of a accompanying guitar player. And he'll add in keys, um, upright bass, like whatever the song calls for, you know, we'll kind of listen to it and fill in the gaps with whatever. Sometimes it's like all electronic. Like I have a song called My One and that one's more electronic vibes mm -hmm. and I'm trying to get more into that too I like I love dancing like in general I just love dancing so I want to make stuff that you can dance to but still like pulls at your heartstrings too you know talking about pulling at strings like your hands look hella soft for somebody who plays guitar like I'm not gonna lie like you know usually not, no it's deceptive I definitely have guitar hands like I usually just sit like this because I'm like don't look at my hands no they look hella soft I was like already looking like okay well you know because you know how like uh, with acoustic because of like the hard string and shit like that shit will fuck your shit up yep 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 yeah no my hands used to be more fucked up honestly because The more I move into electronic and mm -hmm. my computer, the softer my hands get, you hey. know? Room for living time, my hands were a fucking mess, <laughs> like just in shambles, because I was just playing, you know, the, it's an acoustic project, so mm -hmm. I was playing all the guitars on it. Um, but no, like actually some of my guitar playing friends are like, your calluses are gone, like you're not even a real guitar oh. player anymore, you know, because your calluses aren't there anymore. Oh. But um, Fuck that though. <laughs> I'm getting back, I can still do it, you know? I still got it, I think, mm -hmm. yeah. 
But, you know, okay, so I found an interesting quote um, because we were talking about instruments. And it was like, uh, it was on um, a written interview. And you said, I was just super angsty and lonely and it was hard for me to adjust and make friends. So I learned instruments. They were my friends. Mm -hmm. Now it's hard for me to imagine you being super angsty and not being able to make friends because you're like not a shy, you're like a sweet, yeah. cool person. Like what, wh how did you like change so much? Oh uh, man, man, being a fucking preteen is hard, you know? I just, I was just different as a kid. I was, I was a pretty... Wait, preteen is like 12, right? Yeah, oh, okay. yeah like a 12, 11, 12 year old. Um, I don't know, I'm still angsty, you know? I like, I like interacting, this is fun. But in my quiet times, like I still, I just have a, a lot of emotions and a lot of thoughts and I do enjoy people more now. Mm -hmm. But when I was growing up, I was a, just a more quiet kid, like I have, and I have older siblings, I'm the baby, so a lot of times I feel like when you're the baby, you're either super duper loud and like always trying to get attention or you're just in the shadow of your siblings. And I was that more, like I just was more in the shadow. Both of my siblings were more like talkative and outgoing. They were like those people who were adults from a young age, you know? And I was just a kid, like, li like climbing trees in my imagination, like running away from home, you know? Like I was classic kid vibes for a long time and I think when I started getting into the teenage years of when you're supposed to like grow up, especially as a girl and you know. But wait, did you have sisters and brothers? Or older sister and older brother. Okay, okay, okay. So yeah, I, got um, I just missed that boat. I just didn't feel like doing all that stuff. I felt like I started feeling out of place when it came to like being a, a teenage girl. I just felt like I still wanna live in my imagination and I don't wanna have to like grow up, grow up and start like caring about what boys think of me and what you know how to be like cute and like all of those things just went over my head and mm -hmm. that's when I found music and I also moved away from where I was living where I grew up we moved when I was that age so I didn't like have new friends I think it just hit at a weird time where it was hard for me to adjust and instead of trying really hard to become um, more likable mm -hmm. I just started playing instruments and had like three friends throughout high school and Shout out to those three friends. <laughs> you still have them? Um, yeah, I do, actually. <laughs> one of them especially is still one of my best friends. Um, but yeah, like I, it, it ended up working out. It was hard at the time, but it felt good to me. It just felt good to be able to confide in music and all of those emotions I was feeling I put into music, you know? Um, yeah. But from being angsty to actually just fucking going on stage that's just so crazy to me and also for you like um i think nowadays there's a lot of people that they record they're in the studio they put out music and then it gets popular and then suddenly they have to go on tour and they have to go on stage and they're like oh what am i doing and all they do is like playback or yeah. not even really that um but for you you started performing even though you're actually angsty yeah. and then so how did you, when did that decision come? Performing has always been a passion of mine, surprisingly, even though I was shy. Like even when I was a shy kid, I would practice performing in my house, like nonstop. I loved, like I said- In I front of the mirror? Yeah, we had this <laughs> little like, we had this little landing in between the steps that was like kind of elevated in our living room. Stage. And it was like a stage, yeah. I would do like set design. I would put stuff behind it. I would make my brother take pictures. Like it was, it was a lot. But I think that maybe performing always felt like, almost like a cloak that I could put on. Mm -hmm. And I could, I guess like an alter ego vibe, mm -hmm. you know? Um, what would you call your alter ego? I call her Sheba because- mm -hmm. Queen of Sheba. Queen of Sheba. My dad wanted to name me Sheba, but my, so my dad is Ethiopian. My mom is, is African American. And so she knows what it's like to grow up in America. And she was like, if you name our daughter Sheba Mariba and her name rhymes, she, she will literally right. be like, she will never survive school. <laughs> they will just terrorize her, you know? <laughs> so she vetoed that name. Um, but I've always felt like it like lives inside of me. And I feel like when I perform, I become that queen of Sheba, you know, powerful, confident thing. And, um, you know, I try to be that way when I'm off stage too, but I will say that there's a certain thrill to performing that I just can't get enough of. And even to the point where I used to perform when I had no music out and people would be like, okay, this is nice, but like, where do we find your music? I'm like, oh yeah, I guess I should re record some music. 
I just love performing. I'll perform anything, you know? Um, but now it's finally coming together where I have music to perform that's actually out. You know, it was harder for me to record music than to perform. Really? Yeah. Why? Because it felt like fake. Huh. Because performing, you're literally in front of people and you're exchanging energy with them and you're looking people in the eye and you're like feeling them. Mm -hmm. And that's propelling the performance, you know? But when you're in front of a mic and it's like a room and it's closed and it's kind of cold and there's no one in there, it just felt like not as real, you know? I don't, that's that's the best way I can explain it. It was easier for me to perform than to record. I, I've, I've learned how to now, but it definitely was a learning curve for me, learning how to um, perform, but like for myself in front of the mic. Instead mm -hmm. of, I had to imagine people looking at me when I first started recording, just to get the same emotion from it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But what does a recording, recording session with you look like now? Like what do you need to get in the right vibe and mood. I still record, mostly I still record at home. I like Alone or? Um, I might have one, I might have a person like pressing record, but usually I, I record my own vocals. Like probably half of this album I recorded my own vocals. Just because I like to, now I like to just take my time and do it in my own kind of way. And sometimes I'm almost like too consistent of a like I'm like oh I'm sorry I'm taking so long you know whatever mm -hmm. and I don't like feeling that way so I just started recording myself um, but if it's not at home I record at the studio in North Hollywood and it's basically ironically styled like a jungle like the <laughs> wow, okay. the engineer's wife the person who owns the studio his wife is a painter and she painted this whole beautiful like green lush scenery and so the first time I went there, I was like, this is so meant to be. I already knew the title of my project, too. And I was like, I think the first song I recorded there was Planet You. And, um, Which I love, by the way. It's one of my favorites. Thank you. Um, and after that, I was like, I'm coming. If I'm not going to be at home, I'm definitely coming here. Because it felt kindred, you know? Like the same energy. Wait, okay. So the, ju the jungle, the only way out is the only way out. Yes. yes. Okay. So why? Why is the jungle the only way out? Um, the jungle is the, the struggle, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, went through a lot putting this project together. Just went through a lot in the last few years. Um, like losing a parent is a big part of the jungle, you know? That was um, a new experience for, for me. Like, I mean, I, I was like taking care of my, my dad and he was getting sicker and I was trying to record this project. I had just moved to LA and just balancing a lot of things that come with getting older and like the responsibilities that you have t with your family and um, blending that into a career that's not an easy path to take, you know? But outside of my own personal things, I just kind of had a thought when I was in the thick of my own stuff that really everyone who's ever like done something great or like, you know, done something fulfilling to themselves or to, to people, they have to go through something. They have to go through a jungle. They have to persevere through something. If something comes easy to you, like you have to kind of question it, you know? Mm -hmm. Because how long is it gonna be there? You know, how, how real is it? If it came to you that easily, it can leave you that easily. So I kind of realized, you know, man, this shit sucks, but I think there's something good on the other side of it, you know? And that's where the title came from, was just instead of resisting, like instead of fighting against everything that was happening, I just surrendered to it. Like, hey, this is the only way to get to where I'm trying to go. So it's like when you get directions, you know, and all the other streets are like dead ends or one ways, it's like there's only one way to go. And you're gonna have to deal with a lot of shit on that, on that particular route, but it's the only way to get where you're trying to go. But now for somebody losing a parent, um, or generally big losses mm -hmm. of people you're close with, what would you tell people, your fans or generally people going through it? What helped you through it? It's a never ending thing, you know, but I do feel much stronger than I, than I was at the time when that concept came to me, you know? But what I would say is time. Time is the only thing that really, from in my opinion, heals those sorts of things. And I think like, you know, realistically, you're never gonna really fully heal. I mean, it's a big part of you that's, that's gone and that's a natural part of human existence is losing your parents, you know? But, um, but not at such an early not age. Not at an early age, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would say time and then doing something that would, would have made them proud, you know? That usually helps. Like I know my dad, like he used to 
annoy people just talking about how proud he was of me and how I was gonna be like the biggest thing. Like he only knew a few a few artists, so I had to hear that I was gonna be Beyonce a lot. I'm like, Dad, I'm not really the same as Beyonce. He's like, No, <laughs> it's definitely gonna be Beyonce. But um, he was always like really. I mean, yeah, he. Both of my parents honestly are really supportive. But it for my dad, it was more special in a way because he wasn't always that way because he's more traditional and he's from another country and he's just like. I just want my kids to be successful. I don't want my daughter running around trying to be a singer. Like, he just had really negative ideas about where that would lead me. But once he saw how seriously I took it, and I think it was when he came to one of my shows when I was in college, I opened up for our homecoming show, and there were like 5,000, 6,000 people there. And he came, he drove from where we're from, he drove to see it. And he saw the response, and um, it was really, really good. And like, he, after he was like, you should be a singer like people like people seem to like it you know you should really try and so when I graduated school I had his blessing and um, that's really when I dove into the jungle of everything so yeah I would say doing something that makes even if it's not what they told you to do like something that you know is in the spirit of them you know like that would be my my best suggestion and then just give things time don't put pressure on yourself to be fine like it's okay if you're not fine by the way for people that don't know um, having an African parent in my case a mom uh, career choices are pretty much being a teacher <laughs> being a lawyer or a doctor everything else does not count shout out to your dad for, for being so cool then because I know my mom says like the fuck do you do <laughs> no I know it was years of him I feel like he couldn't he couldn't Understand. see me being any of those three things okay. like a doctor engineer or a lawyer so his mind was just like what will she do like what will she do with her life if not those th and then he definitely couldn't see me just like being a wife like a housewife so he's just like my I just, he just didn't understand me the first like 15 years of my life was just confusion he's like <laughs> I don't understand what type of woman you're gonna be I don't understand what job you're gonna have like I don't get it you know but um, interestingly enough, after he passed, his family told me that he used to do music too. He just never told me that. But he used to play oh. the guitar when he was like growing up and he used to sing. So I think maybe he was a little nervous too because he wanted to do that and it didn't work out for whatever reason. So he like wanted yeah. to protect me from that. But it runs in the family apparently. Yeah. That's crazy to find out after, isn't it? Yeah. Like the fact that he could have sat with yeah. you and taught you how to play guitar. Yeah. African parents, man, they're, they're, <laughs> they're mysterious, man. Their thought process is interesting, you yeah. know? They, I think that they just want to protect us from some of the struggles they've been through, you know? And obviously, you kind of, like, look up to your parents, even if you're not trying to. So maybe he was just like, if I tell her that, she's going to really want to do it. Yeah. And I'd rather just not. So. Did, did you ever get to hearing anything he recorded or no. found out? Like, it didn't really record. You know, it was, it was like, a long time ago, ago so okay. people... But it was just more his, his family, just like remembering when he was growing up in Ethiopia and he was always the entertainer and he would always sing songs and like he knew all the Ethiopian songs, he knew how to skista, all the dances and stuff. So yeah, it was really cool to learn that. It was bittersweet, but it was like, oh, okay. I'm not so, I'm not so like odd for my family, you know? Cause everybody else is teachers in my family. Yeah, like, both your parents, my, right? My parents yeah. and almost all my mom's siblings, like I just come from a, educator perspective. sort of perspective and background yeah but so when now you've been to Ethiopia um, a few times yeah. from my understanding last time was for a wedding yeah. um, so when was the first time you went and what was it like the first time I went yeah the first time I went was the life-changing time um, I had dropped out of college <laughs> Again, African parent, my dad was not happy. So my dad was like, I'm sending you to Ethiopia so you could, you know, see what life is really about. And like, you know, he was upset and he sent me there to kind of put life into perspective for me. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the best punishment ever. Like I ended up staying there almost a year. <laughs> I was like, well, now I'm never leaving. Um, but very transformative, meeting my family for the first time. Like, my dad is the only one who came to America from his family. So most of them are still, some of them came to Europe. I have an aunt in Italy, and um, I have an uncle in, in Amsterdam. But otherwise, 
everyone's still there. So there was a lot of expectation on their on their end. They've been hearing about Tom Rott's kids and his whole like American life for years, you know. And I think it just gave me more context of who I am. Like meeting people who look like me, act like me, talk like me. Just we have the same demeanor and it was crazy. Like we grew up across the world, but like my cousins and I is just best friends like immediately and still it's just like a bond that you can't break even with distance um and since then I've been back two times for two different weddings two of my cousins getting married um and Ethiopian weddings are just fire by the way quite a time they go long as hell long (laughs) they last it's a party (laughs) every day is a different event for a week yeah yeah yeah, I've been to Ethiopia a few times, man. Uh, but Addis Ababa, shout out to best food in the world, by the way. Um, but so one thing that um, I thought was very interesting, even though you know we have the jungle as a topic in your in your title of the project, um, the cover art is very dark but warm at the same time through like the brown picture coming through. Now, what was the inspiration behind the cover art, and who are those people in the picture? So um, I've been waiting to explain this because people have been asking and some, I saw some questions about it and I'm like, I have to explain this because mm-hmm. no. Um, I'm in the back. That's me in the back. You can okay, barely, barely see, see that, you. right? Um, and it's my niece in the front, my sister's daughter. And we took the photo a couple years back. Like we took the photo before all of the pro- rest of the project was done. And we wanted to tell the story two different things well i wanted to tell this the photographers that took it twin brothers they go by duramel they're incredible fine art photographers um she represents so much for me like i I feel like when i see like she can sing she has a lot of me and her are kind of kindred um and we're really close we've always been close since the day she was born and i feel like to me she just um represents the coming of age like she's in the front and she's like fresh and you can see her face and she's pure you know and by the time it gets back to me it's like I've been worn down (laughs) you know no really I I mean I like that is that is the concept of it is like I've been not worn down in a negative way but I've been through it you know I've been through things that you can see on her face she hasn't been through yet you know and also it's this sort of guardian thing like I'm guarding my inner child so Something about what I love about music and the reason why I do music is because I feel like especially now with us having so much access to information in the news and just these very um, like intense outlets for, for learning about the world on a daily basis, mm-hmm. I'm really into imagination. You know, I'm really into the things that like keep you hopeful, keep you joyful, and keep you kind of childlike you know and I, I'm really I want my music to inspire people to go back to their imagination you know yeah. and their inner child so I, I we put her in the front to also symbolize like she's an extension of me and she is my inner child and me s- being behind her in that way it's not really about the focus being on me it's about like illuminating that inner child inside of yourself you know so those were the two concepts that we were working with when we came up with it um and by the time she grows up, she's going to be in the back, too. And it'll be a new person that, you know, that represents the coming of age. So, and she was really excited to be on it. <laughs> What's her name? Her name is Sadira. Yeah. She's amazing. She's amazing. She's quite a character. And, <laughs> yeah, she's like, I can't believe I'm, it's, my, it's her face. But people kept asking if it was Janet Jackson. Apparently, she looks like Janet Jackson to people. What? And I was like, just how, <laughs> y'all, how would that even? What? <laughs> Did I go back in time? Like, how would that even have worked? I don't know, but people have people have imaginations. Yeah. Well, that's that's a good good thing, definitely. I didn't think of Janet the first time I saw it, but um, <laughs> that's funny. Um, but for my last question, and then uh, I'll do an outro. Um, on Planet You, which I said is also one of my favorite tracks, uh, Sandstorm as well. Love that. And also, yeah. Jid can sing. Yeah. People, Jid can sing. Yeah. Um, he sang on his first project. We have another song on his first project which called is, All Bad. Which is crazy because then it's like, what can you not do, people? Like, yeah. how is Spillage Village like the most like we talented thing? Here. We just <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, but for me, Planet You is also very special because, holy shit, you're rapping, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. spitting bars, got some serious verses. Yeah. So how did that come to be? 
Um, I've been rapping for a long time um, in Spillage Village. That really is what like inspired me most to, mm -hmm. to really do it because like just being around such talented rappers, um, you can't be weak, you know? <laughs> That's the thing, you can't come with weak bars. Like when you're just <laughs> around, like you can't, Earth Gang, J.I.D., like you can't be whack, you know? Um, but even before them, my cousins, um, my cousins are rappers, a lot of them. And I would just grow up hearing them freestyling and going back and forth. And I'm like, man, like I always wrote music, but I'm like, I want to be able to do that. There's something very freeing about just rapping. Something about the energy of it was really intriguing for me. And I would, I would write verses and go, and then my cousins would be like, that shit was trash. Like, <laughs> like period. Like, they, they were so honest with me. They never, never lied to me. Even to this day, I still feel like when I rap, I'm thinking like, would H be like this? Like, would we play like this, like those are my cousins, you know? So they really taught me, they taught me through listening to them, like how to rap and how to have confidence in that. And Planet U, um, I just was making Planet U, I remember when I was making it and I had the singing part already and I was just like, man, this beat's kind of hard, like I wonder. But when I started trying to rap, I had to rap so fast to like go with the beat. And I was like, man, that's kind of a lot. But then I realized, that's kind of the dopest part. <laughs> if I could really rap as fast as that beat is like asking me to rap, you know? So I worked on it that whole night and um, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy that I ended up adding that. That song, I mean, that song wasn't supposed to be on the project. Like that oh, song was- Wasn't supposed to make the cut? It was really old. Um, it's about my ex and I was trying not to like- Damn, we don't want to shout um, that dude out. <laughs> I mean, shout out him. Thanks for the inspiration, you know? But um, I wasn't intending on including it and I remember I, I like just added it into a playlist and I was playing different ideas for different people and my A&R was like, what's that song? That song is really fire. Like you're really rapping on that, you know? And so then I went back and finished it. But that's how that came to be. Definitely more more bars coming soon. Oh, yeah. I'm excited. I was definitely like, wow, Planet is my favorite song. Oh. <laughs> but um, so anyway, uh, that was <sighs> Mariba and I having a beautiful conversation here in Berlin. I'm very happy about this beautiful second project. Is there anything you would like to say to your fans in Berlin or Europe in general? Man, I can't wait to the be mic. back. Okay. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to be back. How do I say? Um, <laughs> Viel Liebe. <laughs> Oder Liebe Grüße. You can also say Liebe Grüße is like um, That's okay. lovely greetings in a way. What she said? <laughs> I don't even want to mess it up. <laughs> Honestly, Liebe. Liebe? Liebe? Grüße. Grüße. Yeah. Okay. That wasn't bad. That was good. Okay. Liebe <laughs> Grüße. Um, <laughs> All right. Yeah. Cool. Can't wait to be back. Thank you for having me.